Now on to our roundtable for some other points of view. Joining me, senior fellow with the National Center for Public Policy Research, Horace Cooper, political commentator and freelance journalist Ray Baker, and project director of Immigrant Justice with the Advancement Project, Flavia Jimenez. I thank you all. Greatly appreciate it. Thanks so much. Uh, for you being here. Let's, let's talk a little bit about, I, I start off with Wade Henderson, race and this country. Uh, we see, yet again, another opportunity for our country to talk race. It seems to be that elephant we've never figured out how to talk about in the room. Uh, Ray, let me start with you. Do you believe that this may be finally the impetus for our country to really talk about race? I certainly don't. And the reason why is because so often we found ourselves finding quick and easy scapegoats to divert the conversation. We saw the conversation around the Confederate flag being one of those issues. And some were worried initially that conversation around gun control policy would be one of those issues. But until we start to connect systemic racism with individual prejudices mm -hmm. and how that affects people of, of color, then I don't think we're going to have the conversation we're hoping mm -hmm. for, Eric. What do you think? Well, I, um, there are two sides to this coin on this race concern. Black America, white America, and the rest of the country all have perspectives. And all too often, we have a uh, an attempt to have a very cramped conversation that only talks about white America's responsibility with regard to race. This is one big country, and all of us have some yeah, things. There that will we be need those who will argue that rarely do you hear the conversation about their response to race. Uh, it, it usually is the minority's response <laughs> and a question of whether whites have a race issue, quote end quote. You know, and it's not the African American's responsibility at this point to bring up the issue. The issue is with the people that are currently in the majority, right? Which is well, white no, Americans. No, that's not actually the case, and that's the point. There are a small element of people who, for whom race is very, very critical and important, and those people aren't universally white. They're not universally black. They're not universally brown. All of those groups need to be a part of any conversation that we're Yet going to have. Yet whites don't usually view it that way. They see race as your conversation. Right. No, blacks don't usually view it that way. They see it as the need for white America to have the conversation. The point is, there are communities. Look at one Louis Farrakhan. His contribution to the discussion in America about race is poisonous. And yet, we hear no conversation within the now black you know community. what some will say. They will suggest that you bringing up Farrakhan is like me bringing up Oscar Robertson in the NBA's contemporary movement in that, yes, some years ago you might argue whether or not it was poisonous or not. That might be the debate. But his voice is not what it was and is not central and to the race conversation. And neither is Dylan Roots. And neither is well, Dylan Roots. I but if it's going to be an opportunity for a conversation, we need to be open like, to I that. I would like to jump in yeah. just for a quick point. For Although I quite uh, vehemently disagree with uh, our brother Horace here on the point about Minister Farrakhan, I think that begins to go down the path that we're not trying to go, right? right? And the path where we want to go is to see how systems, how infrastructures, how institutions in place bear out and have an effect on folks' day-to-day -day lives. Dr. Sandy Darity of Duke University does the point that whites without high school diplomas get a better callback rate and have better employment numbers than blacks with college. Let me, also, let me ask you what they ask those of us of color often on these to speak for your community. So <laughs> if you will, when you hear what Horace suggested there when he said the conversation is black, white, and others, your constituents, <laughs> do you get tired of that others that also ran? And let's be clear about this. We're clear cl close to being multiracial yes. in this country, right? 2030, we're going to see California's already 50% of the kindergartners in, the, in that class are not white. And so let's have a conversation about what that means for the prosperity in this country, and let's talk about the, the systemic stereotypes and the discriminatory practices that continue to, to impact our communities, our communities of color, but let's bring the, the, the responsibility of whites uh, to this conversation because that's what needs to happen. And that has to be there, the responsibility, because look at the way he even framed that, right? 50% aren't white. So that it starts from a model of assu assumption of viewing things out of the white perspective. Right. And not that it's problematic, but they are, as, as Horace alluded to, they are sitting at the table of brotherhood and the table of humanity with us all. See, I think California is a great example of this issue. I have watched in my lifetime the transformation of the population makeup in California dramatically change. And here's what I have noticed. 
Asians now are a larger minority in California than blacks are. Latinos are a larger minority than blacks are. And whites are a larger minority than blacks are. And what I have seen is that black American political interests have attenuated. And it turns out that unless we're to believe that Asians are now part of this systemic bias and that Latinos are now part of this systemic bias, that what it turns out there are some cultural challenges that are part of the conversation that we need to be having to see why and how we're going to thrive. I don't know that we're going to see another black uh, speaker in the state assembly in California in my lifetime. And that's part of this change that is happening, but it doesn't have to be so. But it needs to be a multiracial conversation around the ways in which we all need and to move forward together. And a multiracial conversation requires a conversation on L all parts, not then. a how, how much of that is Pollyanna in the sense that until we are honest in a mixed room about race, can we ever get to that point? Well, we have to be honest. Let's bring the difficult conversations but and we're put not. them on the table. But the question was really about, it, are we going to be talking about sure. race or not? And I think that the, the answer is, we need to try really hard to get there. <laughs> right, I right? agree. But I mean, but we need to put the uncomfortable conversations on the table. And that's my question, and, and, and I agree with you, but my, my point was, when we're not, there is this self-editing when you're in a mixed room whether it be Absolutely. Hispanics and blacks, well, blacks and white, whatever, wherever the, the mixture is, whatever that concoction is, there is that self-edit. To an extent, that's, that's absolutely true. But th we've seen large groups of, of all of the others, anybody defined as not white, stand in the company of our white American brothers and sisters and not self-edit and be quite frank about that. But we haven't found that reciprocated, particularly among our political leaders, which is interesting considering a woman like Nikki Haley is an Indian <laughs> woman of Sikh ancestry who comes in says on the day of this horrible incident in Char Charleston, excuse me, she says, I, we will never know what was going through the killer's yeah. mind. And so we also see in Louisiana, Bobby Jindal repeatedly slashing disproportionate funds from historically black colleges and universities and continuing siding with conservative policies that work in against the interests of ostensibly Or the all metamorphosis citizens. of change that Lindsey Graham found now <laughs> that he's running for president. Right. I say that we need a balanced conversation. Let's take Cam Kamala Harris, the attorney general, who plans to be the next United States senator from California. California. Let's watch and see what happens in the Democratic primary, the place where we're supposed to see all of these examples of tolerance, the place where we're supposed to see a real ability to have a conversation. I, I challenge you guys to watch and see that there are going to be other minority groups that say it's their time too, and they may Absolutely. push her aside. All right, let me uh, shift gears, if I might, and go to the president and the Supreme Court. Both had big weeks. Uh, let's start with the Supreme Court. A couple of people surprised, quite frankly, with this, the decisions uh, that were handed down, uh, the, the saviors of Obamacare, if you will, uh, and then the question of same-sex marriage, many stunned that this court would, in fact, side for same-sex marriage. A, any surprises there? And B, let me ask you about what the White House has suggested, and that is that Obamacare is here to stay, yet we see Republicans quickly saying, oh, no, no. First of all, let's watch the states too, right? Because we've seen, you know, pr you know, steps in the right direction on the federal, national level on the various issues, and then states trying to pull it back, policy through budget making, right? North Carolina, Georgia, you know, we're seeing it all over the place. First of all, second of all, don't leave out fair housing. Fair housing also saw a big win in in the Supreme Court this this week, and that is extraordinary in my eyes particularly because we saw a, the, 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 a bad voting rights decision in Shelby a couple so of years ago. So what does ago. this say, if anything, about the Supreme Court that most see as far right leaning? I'm extraordinarily uh, happy this week, <laughs> <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and, and particularly with fair housing, that we really, we really should talk about disparate impacts for um, communities of color in this country. Now, a New York Times analysis of this term suggests that it may be mo among the most liberal um, uh, Supreme Court records in about 15 years. Um, clearly, a number of these decisions that came down um, aren't going to comport with the narrative that it's a right-wing court. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Uh, Kennedy uh, has demonstrated a willingness to pivot back and And we and have forth. seen him be the real swing, we should yeah. say, historically. Go ahead. I didn't mean He's to it, No, no, I, and, and, and I, I want us to understand, therefore, that it's not clear that just because someone was named by one, one president or that they are part of a particular court that we know for sure how they're going to and come down. And we've seen that historically, yet we have seen the large shadow of Justice Roberts and especially Justice Scalia, and many believe behind closed doors that uh, Justice Scalia is the one that wields the most push, if you will. 
interestingly enough, uh, Michael Steele told me some time ago that this idea of what we now call Obamacare, Ameri Ameri Affordable Care Act, excuse me, was much out of Jack Kemp's playbook from 1996. Mm -hmm. So if we consider that the original model or template of conservative policy, then it would stand to reason that conservative justices would side with that line of, with that uh, policy. You don't buy that? I don't buy that at all, Lynn. That's not sorry, what the court. What, what part? The I don't that buy that, that the that justice, oh, okay. yeah, you're welcome to tell me whatever Mr. Still said, <laughs> okay. um, but I taught constitutional law, and this example of the ruling in the uh, Affordable Care Act is not a good example for lawyers going forward because it will leave us with no guidance as to how to deal with other agencies when they interpret uh, federal statutes, whether or not when the court says in this instance it's okay, that's no guidance. All right, let me let's, turn let's talk a little bit about it, the, the, uh, the equality uh, versus in the, in the Kennedy decision for the uh, uh, marriage equality. I mean, extraordinary language from, from Justice Kennedy. So I think that we need to, to take this and, and, and be very forward looking in what is next for our country. And I, and I you know, we can re only really uh, walk forward together. On Let this. me wrap the president around all of this uh, this week because I want to talk about his legacy. We've seen a, a, a president more freewheeling over the course of the last few months, um, less shackled by political change, if you will. Don't write me about the reference. Um, <laughs> uh, with the idea of maybe saying a, a bit more about certain things than he would have, certainly uh, first term. Uh, but, but with that, how much do you believe this week really is a microcosm of what his legacy may be beyond the historical? We know that. But the idea of dealing with race and the idea of Obamacare being his big personal push, how much do you believe this week is, is a reflection of that? Well, certainly there are some pieces of that. I have followed immigration policy for a long time, though. So if I could take that for one thing. There are children and mothers being detained on our borders right now, a, hu a complete and total human rights violation. That is a very dark spot for this, uh, this president. Another dark spot, transgender. Uh, women and men and LGBT women and men in immigrant detention. I hope that this president can take the enforcement and detention of immigration and really show us what I think we truly know is in his heart. So he had that very, yeah, and he had that very early on, particularly in campaigning. Do you think now, with the time left, that that is going to have to be left for someone else? N I, I ho hope sincerely not. hope not. I, I, I hope that the, that, that the winds are shifting in the right direction and that he's going to make some good, good decisions coming up. And to your point about the immigration issue, I think that when we look at labor issues and economics, we saw in 2007 and 2008, the president, then senator, campaigned aggressively against NAFTA, against how its outcome affected real everyday workers. And then when we see TPP and TPA come up and we see the president pushing for this and rallying folks, even without the TAA, which forgive all the policy won't talk, but it's trade adjustment that's supposed to compensate for workers who get lose their jobs because of this bill. And we hear a lot of those who have opportunities to see bills like it, they're concerned yeah, about how much of that? Workers. Let me go back to his legacy, though. How much of that is too wonkish for the average person who's going to want to see what, as we do historically, and it usually takes a little time, a little separation, to say, you know, what is the legacy? Do you think that that is ultimately going to be a part of that? I do think it'll be a part in the same way in that moving and in, opening in the same up way the people revere the agreement? President yeah. Bill Clinton still, but folks speak candidly about what NAFTA did for everyday blue collar jobs. Right. I think folks will speak candidly about what this TPP or TPA will do for jobs. And do you think that e either one of the subjects that you all brought up will eclipse the idea of either Obamacare or race? Because let's do the short bio, if you will. What's going to be in a short bio? I think you know that answer, Ed. We're, it's pretty obvious. The historical significance of the first Afri president of African descent. Right. In the I'm, I'm given that. I so think we'll, so we'll what's trump what's all of the things two? that. What's line two? I think, I think the Obamacare is probably yeah, goes there. Yeah, line two is and then, the Obamacare. And to be quite sure. honest, I think same sex marriage will probably yeah. come third. So there's no doubt that there was a huge political victory that the president was able to celebrate with the Supreme Court's decision. But the real question for us is why hasn't the president been able to use his leadership? to persuade the American people that the law itself is a good law. When he's no longer present, the question will then be, what will the, the American people want in, in that particular area? Now, and in terms of, of um, a marriage equality, the president campaigned in 2008 at a posture that is not where he is today. And in fact, one could argue he was leading from behind because he has kind of followed 
the public zeitgeist rather than taking the lead. In California, when he had the opportunity to make sure that they didn't pass the ban on same-sex marriage in 2008 and in 2012 in North Carolina, in both instances, he put his political interests All right, but let ahead. me ask you this. Is that unfair to put that at Mr. Obama's doorstep? When we see that seems to be the political motivation of most, Sure. On either side of the yeah. aisle in today's politics. I thought it was uh, interesting. Uh, Let me just okay, read your quote and pick up on that. This is what Lindsey Graham said about the Confederate flag and bringing it down. This is a circumstance where the people led the politicians. Well, that's I contend exactly, that is often that's the exactly case. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And this is, that's the thing is that politicians, it's interesting. Where, where is that uh, transition happen? Is the transition internal, or is that th and is that something that they come to grow on them, or is it something that they're watching the polls and seeing where I don't what disagree direction with that. is that? What I'm just saying is, you don't necessarily get credit in history for walking into the room after a decision's been made. What you normally get credit in history for doing is galvanizing the change and causing it, and that's the difference. And so, if he wants to take credit whether it's on immigration reform, whether it's uh, the Affordable Care Act, or any of these other issues, it's helpful to be there up front. And that includes the discussion on race. So let me ask you, I didn't ask you, give me the short bio for this president as of today. What do you think his legacy will be? Well, uh, I agree that um, the fact that he was the first person of African descent right, is I gave you that. I gave you all that I, one. I That's that. obvious. But I tell you, unless he is succeeded by a member of his own party, he is going to be highly criticized for his failure to take the opportunity that he had as leader to change and transform the country to the views that he says are the important ones. If he isn't able to do that, I think history will record him not as consequential. Can't you say that of any president? No, absolutely. Ronald Reagan, FDR, Lincoln, lots of presidents oh, have let, been let's, transformational. Let's be careful, though. Let's be careful. I would yeah. agree with you with FDR. But Ronald well, you're Reagan. You're allowed to well, not no, agree. No, no, no. Well, you you're didn't let me finish, agree. though. My show, as far as I see, <laughs> let, let me get this out. Like my house. <laughs> Ronald Reagan, we have seen a transformation in terms of the legacy and how he was seen, certainly to now, from the day he left. And that is the case with most, but your suggestion was this president did not have the opportunity to shape and move and shape the country I to buy into that's exactly what you said. I said he t has appeared not to choose to take the leadership opportunity. Standing up to Mr. Gorbachev and telling him to tear down this wall has resulted in a world where we can live without the threat of communist Soviet Union. <laughs> So when he suggests that he took on al-Qaeda and removed those demons, if you will, that we knew of this time, as Gorbachev was of that time, could he not say the same thing? Well, now, I, I have been a very strong supporter of the president's efforts could using he not droning say the same policy. Thing, I, I'm saying I've been a supporter. It's been progressives that have been criticizing All right, but I'm going to stay with that question. And you have hampered him. <laughs> or so I'm not going to let you, you skate don't around get that credit question, though. because he is cowed because progressives so are criticizing him. Answer the question because there's their follow-up points. He won't I get other credit he to get to. because right. he has been timid. Listen, you and I will argue that when we get off the air. All right, we'll take a quick break here on the other side. Caitlyn Jenner's trend.